I've made billions of dollars of failures at Amazon.com. Literally, billions of dollars of failures. It's easy to have ideas. It's very hard to turn an idea into a successful product. Do something you're very passionate about and don't try to chase what is kind of the hot passion of the day. My job, one of my jobs as the leader of Amazon is to encourage people to be bold. And people love to focus on things that aren't yet working. Um, and that's good, it's human nature. That kind of divine discontent can be very helpful. But uh, you really, you know, it's incredibly hard to get people to take bold bets. And you need to encourage that. And if you're going to take bold bets, they're going to be experiments. And if they're experiments, you don't know ahead of time whether they're going to work. Uh, experiments uh, are, by their very nature, uh, prone to failure. But big successes, a few big successes, compensate for dozens and dozens of things that didn't work. So, you know, bold bets, AWS, Kindle, Amazon Prime, our third-party seller business, all of those things are examples of bold bets that, uh, that, that did work, and they pay for a lot of experiments. I've made billions of dollars of failures at Amazon.com. Literally, billions of dollars of failures. And, uh, uh, you know, you might remember Pets.com or Cosmo or, you know, you know, give myself a root canal with no anesthesia very easily. Uh, none of those things are fun, but they, but they also, they don't matter. What really matters is companies that don't continue to experiment, companies that don't embrace failure, they eventually get in a desperate position where they, the only thing they can do is make a kind of Hail Mary bet at the very end of their corporate existence. Whereas companies that are, you know, uh, making bets all along, even, you know, big bets, but not bet the company bets. I don't, I don't believe in bet the company bets. That's when you're desperate. That's, that's the last thing you can do. I think stress, you can be, uh, like one of the things that's very important to note about stress is that stress primarily comes from not taking action over something that you can have some control over. So if I find that some particular thing is causing me to have stress, that's a, uh, a, a warning flag for me. What it means is there's something that I haven't completely identified perhaps in my conscious mind that is bothering me and I haven't yet taken any action on it. I find as soon as I identify it and make the first phone call or send off the first email message or whatever it is that we're gonna do to start to address that situation, even if it's not solved, the mere fact that we're addressing it dramatically reduces any stress that might come from it. So stress comes from ignoring things that you shouldn't be ignoring, um, I think in large part. So uh, stress doesn't come, people get stress uh, uh, wrong all the time, in my opinion. Stress doesn't come from hard work, for example. You know, you can be working incredibly hard and loving it. And likewise, you can be out of work and incredibly stressed over that. So, and likewise, if you kind of use the, you know, use that as an analogy for what I was just talking about, if you're out of work, but you're going through, you know, a disciplined uh, approach of, you know, a series of job interviews and so on and working to remedy that situation, you're going to be a lot less stressed than if you're just worrying about it and doing nothing. It's easy to have ideas. It's very hard to turn an idea into a successful product. There are a lot of steps in between and it takes persistence, relentlessness. So I always tell people who are, you know, who think they want to be entrepreneurs, it's you need a combination of stubborn relentlessness and flexibility and you have to know when to be which and basically you need to be stubborn on your vision because otherwise it'll be too easy to give up but you need to be very flexible on the details because as you go along pursuing your vision you'll find that some of your preconceptions were wrong and you're gonna need to be able to change those things 
So I think uh, taking an idea successfully all the way to the market and turning it into a real product that people care about and that really improves people's lives is a lot of hard work. I don't really remember the exact day or anything, but when I was in college is when I started thinking about wanting to be uh, an entrepreneur someday. So it was, I was not the kid with the lemonade stand. You know, I didn't, I wasn't one of these kids who was always trying to raise money. I always wanted to be a scientist when I was little, uh, but I'd also always loved computers. I like, I was lucky because at my age, this is unusual to have uh, access to a mainframe computer from my elementary school when I was in fourth grade and uh, quickly learned that the, the, there was a pre-programmed Star Trek game on that computer, and then I never did anything except play Star Trek with the computer. So I don't know how formative that was. It certainly led, it certainly helped my Star Trek knowledge considerably. <laughs> and, and, but I've always loved computers. Somewhere in college, I started watching some of the people who were like setting up, you know, college pizza delivery services and, you know, the kind of the core entrepreneurs and thinking, you know, this looks like a really fun thing to do. Do something you're very passionate about and don't try to chase what is kind of the hot passion of the day. I think we actually saw this, I think you see it all over the place in many different contexts, but I think we saw it uh, in the internet world quite a bit where you know, at the sort of peak of the uh, sort of internet uh, you know, mania in say 1999, you found people who were uh, you know, very passionate about something, they kind of left that job and decided I'm going to, you know, do something in the internet because it's, you know, it was almost like the, you know, the 1849 gold rush in a way. I mean, you find that people, uh, if you go back and study the history of the 1849 gold rush, you find that, you know, uh, at that time everybody who was in, was within the shouting distance of California was, you know, they might have been a doctor, but they quit being a doctor and they started panning for gold. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that almost never works. Um, and even if it does work, uh, you know, according to some metric, financial success or whatever it might be, I suspect it leaves you ultimately unsatisfied. So you really need to be very clear with yourself. And I think one of the best ways to do that is this notion of projecting yourself forward to age 80, looking back on your life and trying to make sure you've minimized the number of regrets you have. That works for, that works for career decisions, it works for family decisions. Um, you know, do you want, I, I have a, a 14 month old son and it's very easy for me to, if I think about myself when I'm 80, I know I wanna watch that little guy grow up. Um, and so it, it's, I don't want to be 80 and think, shoot, you know, I, I missed that whole thing and I don't have the kind of relationship with my son that I wished I had and so on and so on. So if you think about that, so I, I guess another thing that I would recommend to people is that they always take a long-term point of view. And I think this is something about which there's a lot of uh, controversy. You know, there's a, uh, you know, there's a, you know, some, a lot of people, and I'm just not one of them, believe that you should live for the now. I think what you do is you think about the, 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 the great expanse of time ahead of you and try to make sure that you're planning for that in a way that's going to leave you ultimately satisfied. Um, so this is just my, this is the way it works for me. And I mean, this is, everybody needs to find that for themselves. Um, uh, so I think there are a lot of paths to satisfaction and you need to find one that works, works for you. The best defense to, uh, to speech that you don't like about yourself as a public figure is to develop a thick skin. It, 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 it's really the only effective defense because you can't stop it. Um, you know, you are going to be misunderstood. If you're doing anything interesting in the world, you're going to have critics. The only way, if you, if you absolutely can't tolerate critics, then don't do anything new or interesting. And then you can insulate yourself. Then think how wonderful your life will be. Is that the Bezos principle? Um, yeah. Usually people, when you, if you see something, I don't know, you're kind of a public figure and you've probably, things have probably been written about you that you didn't think were nice. That's true. And, um, and, and, and my, my advice, if you came to me and said, Jeff, this, you know, somebody wrote this and it really hurt my feelings. What should I do? I would say, go stand on a street corner and watch in a crowded urban area and watch all the people walk by and think about what they're thinking about. 
I bet you none of those people are thinking about you. If you're staring at that street corner, and really, in your mind, you can do this thought experiment. Like, okay, there's a woman who just walked by. What's she actually thinking about? Probably, but might maybe what she's going to cook for dinner that night, or that um, the argument that she had with one of her employees, or whatever it is. Like, it's not about us.